Hey everyone, Doug here with BH. Today we're looking at something really exciting from Canon. This is the Canon EOS R5C. The word hybrid has been thrown around a lot ever since the 5D Mark II changed the game way back in 2008, but this is perhaps the best version of a hybrid camera we've seen so far. So much so that it literally has a toggle dedicated to two completely different photo and video modes. The camera's menus and overlays change and your experience with the camera changes with it. For anyone who needs the power of a full EOS R5 and the abilities of the Cinema EOS system, there is nothing quite like this. The EOS R5C should look pretty familiar, especially to anyone who has used the R5. A lot of the main body and button layout is clearly derived from the R5, including the electronic mode switch and OLED display on the right, and even the power switch, which has been modified to toggle between stills and video modes. Now, for years now, we've seen systems that have included video as a function of a stills camera, and while it's absolutely true that feature sets and recording quality have gone up dramatically in many cases, the experience is still rooted in a still camera. For proper monitoring, button layouts, menus, codec options, color spaces, time codes, and so, so much more, you usually have to go beyond stills cameras and into the dedicated video camera space, something like the Cinema EOS line, for example. But we were lucky enough to get some time with the R5C, and let me tell you, it's a game changer for anyone who really likes the small size of a stills camera, but craves and needs the control and flexibility of a dedicated video camera. All right, so here we are. These are two, yes, that's right, I have two, brand new Canon R5Cs. Now, as you can see, it looks pretty much like any Canon mirrorless camera here. We have a very similar profile from all sides, except for the back towards the LCD screen, which has some active cooling inside. Other than that, it's pretty much a very similar form factor and build to a regular R5. Um, now, the big thing here is that all the buttons menus all come down to this one toggle here. You have a switch that goes from photo to video or vice versa, and that is not just a simple mode change for the camera. This is actually an entire reconfiguration of the camera from a photo camera like the R5 to a video camera like in the Cinema EOS system. Um, so if you're familiar with either of those systems from one of the cameras in the lineups already, then you'll be at home in either of these modes. But the great thing here is that the buttons on the camera also have double functionality based on the mode that you're in. So for example, the printouts, there's two of them. The one that's inset on the button itself corresponds to the photo mode function, whereas the one that's printed on the outside of the button corresponds to video. And that's great because the camera, again, literally serves as two cameras in one. So standard RF mount here, full frame sensor, you pretty much get an equivalent R5 experience in this body with the exception of the in-body stabilizer. We've got a lot of things to walk through with this camera today. It shoots up to 8K 60 FPS video. We're gonna get into the details of that in a bit, but we got a lot to cover, so let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is show you just how easy it is to switch between the two modes of the camera. It all comes down to just the simple dial on the left side. So let me flip out the LCD screen here so you can see it boots up real fast. We're just gonna go over to video, and you can see it turns right on into the video mode. Now, here we go. The menus, the overlays rather here, are all Cinema EOS style. You have your durations, uh, frame rates, run times, battery life, meters, of course your exposure settings, and the quick menu on the side here. All of it is very familiar if you've shot with a you know, C70, C300, something like that, you'll, you'll know exactly what this all looks like. Let's switch over to photo, and you can see it'll basically reboot into that mode, so it does take a little bit if you're shooting, uh, sorry, if you're switching from one to the other. So, there we go, we're back into photo mode, and this menu should look familiar to anybody who shot with a mirrorless still camera uh, in the last few years. So we have here, the mode here, we're in aperture priority, of course, uh, shots left, exposure down below, and otherwise it's pretty clean and it's completely different from the cinema style setup. So it is literally two cameras in one, I cannot stress that enough. But right now we're gonna set up for a nice 8K shot, so let's go back to the video mode and see what we're looking at. All right, cool. So we're back in video, and let's start setting it up. So we're just setting up a shot here. You can see that we're already in 8K, and we're set to raw standard 12-bit. Uh, that is the standard compression level for this. Now, exposure controls, I've already kind of set this up. 
but it's interesting because this camera has to fit a lot into, you know, basically a mirrorless sized body. The function button up here, right towards the shutter button, will bring you through the main exposure and color temperature controls. And of course you can do this through the touch-based quick menu, um, and you can do it through here as well. But we're gonna stick with what we have right now. We're shooting here in C-Log3, that's what it comes with. You have C-Log3 but not C-Log2 here, and at 23.98. And you notice here, we have two run times listed for RAW on the CF Express card and XFAVC on the SD card. Uh, and you can set it up to record both. You can do a proxy if you want. You can do uh, lower res, you can do a re relay record, things like that. Um, otherwise, this is good to go. So we're gonna hit roll on this. And let's see, Bobby's looking pretty fancy over here. And the first thing that comes to mind even on this screen, and this is a testament to the screen as well, is it renders the, the color gorgeously. I mean, we have pretty much all reds here. We have skin tone the couch, we have the walls, even the shoe here. It's all pretty warm colors and they all look very separated, delineated. Um, and we have just some very simple light coming in from the window. I've thrown a fill light on the side here. Looks gorgeous. The idea here is to provide equivalent experiences to both photographers and filmmakers by completely changing the camera's functionality based on the mode you're in. In photo mode, you essentially have an entire EOS R5 at your fingertips. Full frame, 45 megapixel images, 20 FPS electronic burst capture, dual pixel autofocus with face and eye detection, and more. It even utilizes the same CF Express and SDXC card slot setup, giving you fast write speeds and redundancy. The only thing missing here from the original R5 is the in-body stabilizer, so you'll have to use lens stabilization here. In video mode, the camera's menu system switches over to the Cinema EO style, so if you've used a C70 or even a C300 Mark III, you'll recognize the menu layout. Button functionality even gets transposed over to a Cinema EO style with focus punch-ins and AF control. And I haven't even talked yet about recording spec. The R5C can record up to 8K, that's right, at 60 FPS in cinema raw light, and can shoot up to 4K, 120 FPS in its slow motion mode. There's even very video-centric features here, like timecode input, and a whole range of monitoring tools. So as far as monitoring is concerned, you have a few options here. You have, let's see, view assist, which we have enabled for LUT preview, and the big ones are waveform and vector scope monitoring as well. Of course, you also have false color, which will help with a lot of exposure. And you have focus guides, zebras, and peaking as well. One thing I always like about Canon cameras is they have really solid autofocus. We have dual pixel autofocus on this, of course, working for both photo and video. Now over here on the video side, if we go over, I'm gonna enable continuous focus, and I already have face detection and tracking on. We'll even get some eye detection in there. And as soon as we go out, you can see it's locked onto Bobby's eye here. Bobby, could you just move around a little bit? There we go, and it, it's rock solid. In fact, let's roll on that, and you can see it follows. Uh, can you go fast? Yep. And if he, can you get up and then come back? We could see that the camera, of course, loses him, but as soon as he comes back, it gains right back onto his eye, locks right on. So I've switched over to photo mode right now. You can see we are, actually I can flip this around for you. I've switched over to photo mode and I've already got autofocus enabled and we're just treating this like an R5. Do some portraiture. Yeah, let's see here. Yeah, cross that leg, there we go. Beautiful, excellent. And yeah, so feels and works, looks exactly like an R5. It's honestly, it's hard to really feel the difference. It's just a tiny bit bigger, but it, it really handles exactly like that. As you can expect, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to recording on the R5C. It has both a CF Express Type B slot and an SDXC slot, giving it the same dual recording functionality as the regular R5. Now in photo mode, this means you'll want CF Express for 20 FPS continuous shooting, while in video mode, you'll need it for the 8K raw video. 
The breakdown, of course, is based on codec and bitrate, which we'll get to in a minute. But for video in particular, you can do things like RAW on one card and XFAVC or proxy recordings on another. You have professional level flexibility here that you usually only see on dedicated video cameras. So let's talk codecs. You have three overall codec options starting at the top with Cinema Raw Lite. You can choose raw compression levels based on the frame rates and resolutions you're in. 8K60, for example, can only shoot in raw LT, but you can use the standard quality mode up to 8K30. All raw modes provide you 12-bit color depth, meaning your color grading options are unparalleled. Then there's the non-RAW options, which includes XFAVC up to 4K in 10-bit 422, and HEVC, which is actually wrapped in a simple MP4 container, but does allow you to shoot in 10-bit as well. What is interesting is that while the HEVC modes don't have the MXF wrappers that you'd get from XFAVC shooting, they are able to shoot in the 8K resolutions, meaning if you need 8K resolution but don't want the data rates of RAW shooting, HEVC is an option to consider. If you're recording in compressed formats, you also have all of Canon's typical color profiles at your disposal, including C-Log3, YDR, PQ, HLG for the HDR lovers, and a 709 standard profile as well. There's of course a 709 LUT preview on the camera to assist in exposure, including on the HDMI output. Lastly, the camera's RAW modes aren't limited to 8K. You can also do a Super 35 crop, bringing you to a 5.9K RAW image, and a further Super 16 crop, resulting in a 2.9K image. Since these are RAW modes, they have to be cropped in, but in compressed modes, the lower resolutions like 4K, for example, are direct full frame over samples. So we're gonna test out the 8K 60 FPS mode here. This is basically the top end spec of the camera. It's a little tricky though, because there's not enough power from the battery to the lens mount, which disables the electronic communication of the lens. Now, I'm gonna explain all about that in just a sec, but right now, let me first just set the camera up for 8K. So all you have to do is, just like any other format, you go right into the menu, and we're gonna switch the codec from RAW ST to RAW LT, because that is required. You have to drop down just a bit. It's still 12 bit, by the way and then change your frame rate to 5994. Now, when you do that, first off, you'll notice the lens turned off and you'll actually get a disclaimer that tells you that the lens will not work with this. Now, that doesn't mean you can't record. You actually can still record, the camera won't stop you. So let me just show you your options here. So yes, in fact, the EOS R5C can record the top end spec of 8K at 60 FPS in RAW and in fact, RAW is the only way to shoot it. But there are some caveats and limitations to keep in mind when shooting in that format. Number one comes down to power. In fact, it all comes down to power. The new battery, the LPE6NH, does have a higher capacity, but because it has the same voltage delivery as the older versions, it's limited in how much it can give to the lens mount and the camera at that top spec. That means that you lose things like electronic lens communication. So if you have older lenses, cinema glass, things like that, you should be fine because the workflow for those are manual anyway. But if you do need electronic lens control, which includes iris and focus for modern RF glass, you will need supplemental power. Now there are a few options in mind. The first one we don't actually have here today, it's Canon's own PDE-1. This is a USB power supply. It plugs straight into the USB-C port of the camera and gives it that additional voltage necessary. You can, of course, get third-party solutions for that. This here, the Anker PowerCore Plus 26,800 PD 45 watt. This is the only one that has been approved by Canon for use with the camera. And this has USB-C power delivery, which does give you the necessary voltage again. So now the other solutions are kind of similar to what we've seen in the past. This probably looks pretty familiar. This is not the standard DC coupler DRE6. This is actually the new DRE6C and it is necessary to do this in this configuration with the R5C. That, of course, hooks straight into the power supply, the CA946. This is the AC adapter for the camera, and you can use that to give yourself AC power. Now, there's one more solution in the form of a P-TAP adapter from Anton Bauer. This also hooks straight into the DC coupler, giving you a similar solution, but into a cinema-style rig, for example. So one more detail, this whole workaround situation is only necessary if you shoot at 8K above 30 FPS, 5.9K above 30 FPS, both in RAW by the way, or 2.9K in RAW above 60 FPS. 
Other than that, you should be fine with just the regular battery. So I'm gonna keep it simple and go with the anchor power supply that I mentioned a moment ago. And we're just gonna plug that right in. Now, if I actually go out of the menu for a sec, just so you can kind of see. the Right now, I can't tap to focus, right? That's because the lens is disabled. So once I attach the battery, it'll kick in and I can now tap to focus. And it even says USB PD on the side for USB power delivery. So this will actually power the battery and can charge it too. So you'll have full control and you'll have the necessary voltage you need to control an electronic lens. So again, this is one option. There's a few others that I mentioned before, but right now, this is the easiest. While the R5C does indeed retain the ability to use battery grips such as the BGR10 and the WFTR10A, both of which can double the battery life, they don't increase power output to record 8K60. So we just want to take a quick look at the slow motion recording options here. You've actually got a bunch of frame rate options. The R5C can go all the way up to 120 FPS in 4K, but it does require some configuration. So first thing is I'm going to get out of RAW go over to XFAVC, it's still 422 10-bit. Drop down to 4K UHD, 3840 by 2160. We'll go in the 160 megabit long op mode here. And we're gonna stick in 2398. And that's because the 120p recording actually is in the slow and fast motion mode. So it's not a native frame rate, but you do still have full autofocus support. So here we are, here's the top of the camera, just taking a quick look at some of the physical options here, the layout of everything. We are in photo mode, of course. You can see that the overlays here are the photo overlays for the R5 mode. Now, the one thing that I want to point out is the mode wheel here. This is, of course, the exposure wheel, and it doubles up. If you just hit mode, you can see that you have the mode change on both the LCD and the OLED display up here. Uh, everything is mirrored, so you know your most common exposure values are listed here. You'll also see that there's a numerous amount of function buttons here. Uh, they're all customizable, everything is customizable, so if you want to change it up from the default, that's obviously up to you. Um, but they have double purposes, so if we look on the back side here, you can see that there's an inset print and an outside print for every button. And that's because it just corresponds to different things. The inset is for the photo mode and the outside is for the video mode. And a lot of times they do kind of relate to each other. For example, here, info, we'll just change the info on the display for photo. And it kind of does the same thing for video too. Um, but if you look at something like AF lock here, in video mode, this will just enable or disable AF. Um, but in photo mode right here, it allows you to change the AF mode. So it's a little different. As you can see, the R5C is largely based around the R5's body, with the only noticeable exception being the active cooling solution located behind the LCD screen. That LCD screen, by the way, is completely articulated, which is nice to see here. In my use with the camera, I could barely hear the fan inside, and in a real-world situation, I don't think it'll pose an issue for sound recording at all. The good news is that this cooling solution promises unlimited recording time with no overheating. Plus, I barely felt a difference in weight to the camera. Now, while the R5C does everything it can to replicate the Cinema EOS experience, you won't find things like ND filters or built-in XLR ports here. But Canon does have something for audio. So if you're shooting video with the R5C at some point, you're gonna want to record audio with it as well. Now, since it is closer to a still camera body, you aren't gonna see things like dedicated XLR ports here. You will, of course, have you know the usual eighth inch microphone jack input, which gets you standard stereo audio. But if you do need XLR, you can use the Tascam CA XLR 2D. And now this is something that was designed with the multifunction shoe in mind. And it actually debuted alongside the EOS R3 and the XF605. Now this will get you two XLR or TRS inputs. Of course, you have your manual controls on the other side, but the real interesting thing here is that it has a 
bottom compartment for AA batteries. And that is so that it takes the power draw away from the camera's battery. So you can extend your shooting time and not necessarily drain it by having an additional piece of equipment on it. Now, the other thing is, Combine this with the microphone input on the camera and you can have a total of four channels of audio. Believe it or not, there's also timecode input on the R5C, which can let you sync it up with any timecode generating camera or device. We're using a Canare DIN to SDI cable here, which could feed from another camera like a C70, for example. Due to the longer sheath of the Canare DIN cable, it's the recommended option for this camera as it's easier to disconnect from the recessed DIN port. And as for the overall dimensions and weight, the EOS R5C is 5.6 inches wide by 3.8 inches tall with a depth of 4.4 inches. It comes in, body only, at just 1.7 pounds. Now with this form factor, some of you are rightfully probably wondering how this compares to something like Canon's own EOS C70. Well, though there are many similarities on the surface, the C70 is of course solely a video camera and with that comes a whole different set of priorities. The two big differences, to me at least, would be the ND filters and the XLR ports, which are not present on the R5C. Don't forget the R5C does have the XLR adapter though. The other notable differences are the dual gain sensor on the C70 and the use of BPA style batteries, which offer significantly more recording time. That's not to say these cameras can't complement each other, and the R5C is the one with 8K full frame raw, the C70 being Super 35, so there are advantages to both. The EOS R5C is fascinating because it feels like the hybrid camera we've always dreamed about. As far as feature set goes, there really isn't much missing here. The power solution for 8K60, though it is a little bit awkward I'll admit, means that this camera still resides in the mirrorless EOS space, and thus it maintains a similar form factor and accessory compatibility. As a stills camera, it is equivalent to the regular R5 in all but stabilization, meaning that this one camera opens the door to any professional who takes on both stills and video work, and we know there's a lot of us out there. So that's it for the Canon EOS R5C. I'm Doug with BNH, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.